Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of our ECB legal conference. I have the honor this morning to chair the third panel on central bank immunities and international sanctions. I'm today replacing the president, uh, who has a keen interest in this topic, and therefore will join us soon, actually, in the room. But having taken a clear position on some of these issues, uh, prefers not to be part of a debate that she wants to be totally open and candid. So that's the reason why you have to settle for me today. I would like to uh, try to frame a little bit the discussion. Why this panel? Why is this relevant today? Now, for many years, the law of immunity has been one of the most controversial topics about, uh, among international lawyers. Uh, you just need to follow the long saga between Italy and Germany on whether uh, immunities can be used as, as a defense, even in cases where uh, this would prevent victims from obtaining justice from atrocities uh, committed during armed hostilities. And you will see there has been a judgment of the International Court of Justice, and recently in July, the second judgment of the Italian Constitutional Court that seems to have put an end to this, fortunately. But just to say how important the issue of immunity is. The principle has developed as a principle of customary international law. It is based on the principle par imparem non habet imperium, which means um, one state cannot judge on the other one, and vice versa. It's a principle based on the equal sovereignty of state. As a principle of customary law, the principle of state immunity is determined by state practice and by the opinion juris of uh, a number of instances. And this uh, practice can be found in international treaties, in decisions of national and international courts, in national legislation, in opinions of national legal advisors, diplomatic correspondence, practice of international organization. All this comes together to form the uh, customary law. And one very important piece in this area is the UN Convention on the jurisdictional immunities of state and their properties. Now, this convention has not entered into force because it has been ratified only by 22 states. However, is recognized as an authoritative expression of customary international law. Looking at central bank, how does immunity then comes to central bank? Uh, it is a relevant point and has come to the fore recently as a part of a broader trend recently towards greater interference on the uh, central bank assets abroad. And this interference has increased both in scale and in scope, ranging from temporary restrictions to permanent expropriations. Uh, in particular, we all have in mind what happened in, on 28 February 2022, four days after the Russian uh, forces invaded Ukraine, when the Western states uh, holding uh, assets of the Russian central banks in a coordinated action decided to ban all transactions with the Russian central banks by their citizens and on their territory. This development, of course, opens a new chapter in the debate on sanctions against central banks for three reasons. The first is that the amount of central bank reserves affected are significant, especially when compared to the assets of listed private individuals. The second, and more importantly, in my view, is that until now, sanctions have been relevant for smaller central banks with a relatively minor role in the international monetary system. Now, freezing of the Russian central bank reserves has been described as crossing uh, a Rubicon, an economic and political Rubicon. Uh, with the words of uh, Adam Tooze, if central bank reserves of one G10 member um, entrusted to the accounts of another G10 member uh, central bank are not sacrosanct, nothing in the financial world is anymore. So it is a qualitative change in the discussion. And the third reason is that there are now proposals to use the central bank reserves to pay reparations to Ukraine. And these proposals range from the outri outright confiscation to using proceeds from these assets. Now, the difference is, like, unlike, is that unlike sanctions, uh, which are temporary measures and have uh, uh, the objective of persuading the infringing state to uh, comply again with international law, this proposal are actually aimed at reparation, not, um, and they are not temporary, most of them. So let me make a step back as well to, uh, to see why, again, we should discuss this today. Uh, 
we need to approach the question of interference with central bank assets from um, part as a part of a much broader question. So how can we, the international community, or perhaps looking better, the West part of the international community, how can we address threat to international peace and security, and at the same time, first, maintain the respect for the international rule of law? So not become ourselves the monster that we are fighting. And second point is how can we do that by uh, nevertheless avoid increasing the geopolitical fragmentation of the world economy, as this could not only reverse the economic benefits of globalization, but more importantly could trigger wider confrontations. We need to show that we have learned our lessons from the past and the dangers uh, of economic entrenchment and confrontation are not small. So both these issues are very complex and they contain multiple legal, political and economic dimensions. Now, as lawyers, we face a particular challenge, which is linked to the interpretation, uh, because the interpretation of the existing rules often contradict each other. There are scarce judicial pronouncement, very scarce judicial pronouncement, and states, of course, argue normally on the basis of political expediency more than on the basis of the law. There is little explicit jurisprudence and doctrine on sanction and immunity rules in particular, and some people uh, even speak about uh, blind spot. So let me indicate three questions without answering them that uh, are open in this respect. The first is the question of the scope of the immunity. Are central bank assets protected by state immunity? The question more specifically is whether there is an irrefutable presumption that everything that the central bank holds is covered by the, immu the immunity, or whether, um, in fact, it depends of, on the usage. And here we have different state practices. Let me just briefly mention the Court of England and Wales and the Netherlands, based on the convention I was mentioning before, uh, claim that uh, or consider that all assets handled by central banks are categorically covered by the immunity. While uh, recently a uh, judicial pronouncement in Sweden, and this fo follows a little bit the German and US uh, the, um, jurisprudence, consider that you need really to look for what this is used. So only if it's for sovereign purposes, for its own accounts, or central banking task only. Uh, so it's more limited, the scope. The second question that is open is whether the immunity is from judicial proceeding or also from execution. And there again, there are, um, there are two main schools of thoughts, and they were very well represented in the all-time uh, International Court of Justice case, um, Timor-Lester, um, where um, one view is that the immunity only covers immunity from jurisdiction, so from the pronouncement of a judge, but uh, an executive order of the uh, executive would be not covered by immunity. That was the view of uh, Australia, while the view of Timor was uh, that, uh, in fact, if you provide immunity, the immunity uh, needs to extend also to the executive uh, actions, because otherwise this would be rather incongruous and they would uh, nullify the effect of the immunity, and also because the school of thought argues there is some Sometimes a difficulty in distinguishing judicial from executive because in some cases the executive decision needs to be confirmed by a judge. So that's a second question. Uh, then we have the, um, the issue of, um, of um, can this be justified as a countermeasure? Can a sanction be a countermeasure? Now, what is a countermeasure? Countermeasure is uh, an act of a state against another state that normally would be illegal, but it is not be illegal because it is actually taken in order to force the other state to comply with international law. And here the first question that arises is, can one uh, adopt a countermeasure not for protecting itself, the state itself, but to protect another state or to protect the rule of law as such? Um, Linked to countermeasures, there is also the issue of reversibility. Countermeasures should be reversible. They are there to put pressure in order to comply with international law. Uh, 
Um, so the question is um, whether, when we look at the concrete case we have in front of us, the Russian measures have the characteristic of countermeasure. And I don't dwell on that because we have enough speakers who will, will uh, talk about that. Um, there is also the question whether immunities could be waived. And here I come back to what I mentioned at the beginning, the saga Italy-Germany, because the question is, of course, uh, in many areas of law, when you have fundamental principles, uh, you do uh, balance those principles. You do have some exception. And here, the International Court of Justice has taken a stance that is very, very strict and basically says it is impossible to derogate from uh, state immunity, even when there is a violation of a very, very important principle of international law, which would be armed aggression is, of course, the most, uh, the most serious one. So I don't want to dwell on all these questions. I've just thrown them on the table. We have uh, enough um, bright people who will help us reflecting on this. Um, but I would like again to remind that dealing with these issues is absolutely crucial now um, to preserve the international order uh, on a rule-based system. I think for us lawyers, it is absolutely important not to forget this, not to be pushed by the emotion of the moment, which of course is very important, uh, and not to move into an anarchic environment in, what, in which the rules that we have conquered through very long time and practice will be um, then lost uh, and disregarded. So we have here a fantastic panel. I'm so happy to, be, uh, to have this privilege to chair them. Let me briefly introduce them, and then we will move to a discussion on these issues. So first of all, Professor Ingrid Brunk uh, holds the Helen Strong Curry Chair in International Law at Vanderbilt Law School. She's an expert of international law, transnational litigation, foreign relations law and her uh, influential scholarship on foreign sovereign immunity has appeared in leading journals. She has advised governments, private parties on many immunity-related topics, especially central bank immunity. So we have here uh, the expert. <laughs> Among other things, which I cannot list because the list is too long, she is uh, currently serves as um, co-editor-in-chief of the American Journal of International Law that you all know, and as a member of the American Law Institute. Then to my right, I have uh, Mr. Rick uh, Ostrander, who is the general counsel of the um, Fed New York uh, and the head of the legal group there. He has a hell of a job because he oversees the day-to-day -day operation of the group, so you can imagine, ranging from legal, compliance, bank application, group operations, strategy, and even record management. Uh, he is also a member of the Bank Executive Committee and serves as um, the uh, Deputy General Counsel of the Federal Market Open Committee. Before joining the Fed, um, uh, Mr. Ostrander was Managing Director in Legal and Compliance at BlackRock, where he oversaw the legal coverage of trading activity and technology products. And before that, and they're going back uh, quite a while now, Managing Director of Morgan Stanley, responsible for global legal coverage of the firm's fixed income division. And to my left, I have Dr. Irina Bogdanova. Uh, she's an international law scholar from Ukraine. She earned her PhD uh, degree from the Faculty of Law of Bern. And prior to this, she has uh, studied in Ukraine, in Switzerland, in Canada, and in the Netherlands. So a real international lawyer. Currently, she holds a position as a postdoctoral researcher uh, based at the World Trade Institute at the University of Bern, and her research is supported by the Swiss National Science Foundation. Now, recently, her focus of her research has been on uh, various aspects of economic statecraft, but her recent book, which is the most interesting, uh, I think, explores the legality of unilateral economic sanctions, so those imposed by individual states without authorization of the UN. So let me now turn to them and see how they can help us, um, uh, you know, uh, studying and, and uh, dissecting all these questions. And thank you for bearing with me for the a little bit long introduction, but I think it was uh, so. So I, I will start with you, Ingrid, if you don't mind. <laughs> Maybe you could give us an overview as, um, of the bank uh, sanctions and the legal issues that are related to uh, them and that they generate. Uh, there is a little bit of practice recently, no? Uh, 
Uh, yes, happy to do so. Um, thank you uh, so much for the invitation to be here. It's a real, it's a real honor. Um, so, uh, sanctions imposed on central bank assets are, as you've already said, uh, not new. Um, but obviously, with the sanctions imposed on Russian central bank assets, um, the topic is uh, 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 has become heated, and the number of assets um, currently sanctioned are growing in scale and complexity. Uh, but it is important to remember that, particularly the United States. States, but not only the United States has in the past imposed sanctions on Afghan, Venezuelan, Iranian, Russian, Cuban, North Korean, and other central bank assets. Um, and it's also important to think um, of this debate uh, not only in the broader context of immunity, but in the context of the broader global debate about sanctions uh, uh, generally. Um, sanctions imposed on, for, especially on foreign states and state institutions rather than individuals um, are quite controversial globally. Uh, detractors, including many countries in the global south, argue that sanctions um, do not achieve their stated goals. They serve as tools of coercion wielded by powerful countries, um, and they harm vulnerable populations and individuals who have engaged in no uh, wrongdoing. Uh, proponents of sanctions, by contrast, um, argue that they're a helpful tool for deterring negative conduct, such as terrorism, human rights violations, wrongful weapons programs, and of course, um, as we know today, um, uh, unlawful military aggression. Um, sanctions impose specific Specifically on central bank assets are part of this broader debate, um, but as you know, they raise distinct issues, um, especially when it comes to domestic and international law uh, governing foreign sovereign immunity. Now, as Chiara has already noted, um, uh, in a general sense, central bank assets can take two forms. Um, most sanctions regimes freeze assets in one way or another. So sanctions by the United States on the Central Bank of Iran have prohibited U.S. persons from engaging in any transactions with the bank, and they have penalized foreign financial institutions that engage with the Central Bank of Iran. Um, sanctions of this kind can last for decades. They can serve as leverage in ongoing disputes, and they can have a profound impact on the populations involved. Um, but they don't involve a formal change of ownership. In other words, they freeze um, the assets um, but do not confiscate them. Now, some sanctions regimes make controversial designations about who actually represents a foreign state. So think for a moment about Venezuela. Um, some states, including the UK, um, designated Juan Guaido as the representative of the Venezuelan government for the purposes of control over Venezuelan central bank assets located in the UK. But formally, um, Venezuela remains the owner of those assets. Um, uh, and the disposition by the United States of some Afghan central bank assets present a similar issue, <clears throat> as I hope we will uh, get a chance to talk about later. But notice that these controversial decisions, which I think under public international law we would characterize as decisions about recognition, um, don't technically confiscate uh, the assets. Now, some sanctions do confiscate um, turn assets over to new owners, although this is far less common than asset freezes. <clears throat> now, in this space, we see an interesting interaction of domestic law and international law. Um, in the United States, and I think in other countries as well, uh, sanctions regimes in place, currently in place, don't authorize confiscations. So specific legislation is generally necessary to achieve that purpose. So the United States, for example, has enacted very specific legislation that allowed assets of Iran's central bank to be turned over in uh, litigation. The US is, as many people know, also considering legislation that would confiscate Russian central bank bank assets located in the United States. Now, specific uh, legislation um, is necessary, and depending on the country um, or in, in the EU, um, that legislation might have to take 
particular form to satisfy domestic constitutional constraints. Deprivations of property um, are regulated constitutionally. And so there's an open question in many places whether you can um, use purely executive power to confiscate assets in a way that is consistent with the domestic constitution. Now that intersects with the immunity question because there's this, this issue of whether executive actions are covered by immunity or not. So you might avoid immunity by using executive action, uh, but that might be unconstitutional um, or otherwise um, unlawful. Um, notice there are also potential constraints imposed by bilateral investment treaties or um, there's the bilateral investment treaty between the US and Russia is not enforced, but there may be customary international legal obligations that limit uh, confiscations or expropriations. Um, but immunity immunity gets the lion's share of the attention here, and it's um, the, the primary, um, uh, I think, legal limitation on, on um, confiscating central bank assets. So immunity um, uh, limits, um, and I, I think this is important, and I, I have a position in the debate that Chiara, um, uh, one of the debates that Chiara mentioned um, about whether immunity applies um, uh, to executive and judicial judicial action or just to judicial action. Um, I think it's pretty clear from state practice um, that immunity limits judicial but not executive power, and it limits judicial power over foreign states and their assets. These are two different kinds of immunity, immunity from jurisdiction to adjudicate, that is, you simply cannot sue the Russian Central Bank in courts in the United States. That's immunity from jurisdiction to adjudicate. There is a distinct immunity, uh, which is immunity from measures of constraint or execution, meaning that you cannot use any form of judicial process to attach or seize central bank assets located in the forum state. Those are two, as I said, distinct kinds of immunity, um, but both of them um, uh, are immunity from some form of judicial process. And I, I won't move further into this space, but I'm extremely happy to defend um, th uh, that, that view. Um, the special central bank immunity, right? There's a special immunity for central bank assets, and that is related to that second kind of immunity, which is immunity from execution. Um, and central, there is, are exceptions to immunity from central bank, um, immunity from uh, jurisdiction, uh, excuse me, from, uh, there are, let me start that sentence just completely over. There are exceptions to immunity from execution. Most of those exceptions do not apply to central bank assets. This is the special and heightened form of immunity that central bank assets enjoy. Chiara is correct that the scope of this immunity on the margins is contested. Does it apply to all central bank assets or just central bank assets used for central bank purposes? There has been no dispute, however, that at its core, it applies to foreign currency reserves deposited in the forum state. So yes, there is a dispute, but it does not go that far. There is zero contrary state practice. Um, uh, all right, um, and I, uh, we're going to have mostly a discussion, uh, so I will, I will wrap up um, uh, uh, here. Um, uh, most central bank sanctions involve um, asset freezes, and these are conducted through executive, not judicial power, and they therefore don't implicate immunity at all. Um, this point is reflected in the UN Convention, um, to which you've already made reference. Um, it is also reflected in state practice. Um, it is disputed by some scholars, um, but it's important for understanding um, the measures um, in question about turning Russian central bank assets over. Um, all right, finally, I've noted that the U.S. has in the past taken measures to confiscate Iranian central bank assets through the judicial system. Um, uh, I think that cannot be justified um, based on countermeasures and probably puts the United States in violation of important norms of customary international law. The immunity to which foreign central bank assets are entitled, especially foreign currency reserves, is something about which states around the world agree. China, 
passed a new state immunity law just days ago. It includes the same special protections for foreign central bank assets um, that will likely apply in Hong Kong. None of that is new. That has been China's practice and China's policy. But the new statute highlights that this is in a world of growing economic divisions. Um, this is one place where there is a great deal of uniformity, um, a little bit of dissenting uh, US practice notwithstanding. So I will conclude there. Thank you. Wow, that's a very good. Uh, I, a very good start for our exploration. I would like to move to to Yurik. Uh, could you uh, maybe give us uh, your perspective about the central bank immunity uh, as it was established in the U.S.? Because of course, this is something you deal with it <laughs> day by day, no? Uh, ha happy to do so. And, and I, I first want to thank you, uh, Dr. Zilioli, for the invitation uh, to be on the panel today. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. I also need to mention that my remarks today are my own, do not reflect the position of the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System generally. Um, so foreign sovereign immunity in the United States is governed by the Foreign Sovereign uh, Immunities Act of 1976, or FSIA. That's not to say that uh, sovereign immunity didn't exist in the U.S. prior to the uh, Foreign Sovereign, uh, sovereign Immunities Act. Um, before that, we had a, a, a long history of court cases uh, that established uh, sovereign immunity. Those court cases started with the concept of absolute immunity, uh, and that was carved back over time uh, for a number of things. For example, a commercial activity of a sovereign uh, became uh, exempt from sovereign immunity. Uh, so the court cases established a number of exceptions, and the FSIA was was really enacted in part to to bring certainty and uh, to those both exceptions and to the the grant of, of sovereign immunity. The legislative history and, and and text of the FSIA make it clear that Congress was concerned that if central bank property were left vulnerable to attachment. Uh, deposits of central bank reserves uh, in the U.S. would be discouraged, and by implication, uh, the stability of the international financial system could be potentially undermined. Uh, also, by permitting execution against central bank reserves without explicit waiver, uh, that could result in, in potential foreign relation issues uh, uh, for the United States government. So, as has been mentioned, uh, the FSIA provides two types of immunity immunity from jurisdiction of U.S. courts, and immunity from uh, execution or, or the ability to attach assets uh, to satisfy a judgment. Uh, specifically, Section 1609 and 1611 of the FSIA establish immunity protections for the attachment of property of foreign states held in the U.S. That immunity, as been mentioned, is not absolute. Uh, there is an exception, uh, Section 1610 of the FSIA, that provides uh, examples of situations where um, attachment would be allowed. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, an, an important exception uh, is for assets of a foreign state used for commercial activity in the United States. So, so and that doesn't seem unreasonable. However, this exception uh, could be read to capture core central banking functions, um, reserve management, uh, which we would not want to capture uh, in that exception. So the FSIA addressed that issue by including a specific provision uh, that, that is only applicable to central banks and monetary authorities, that's section 1611, that provides immunity from attachment or execution for all property of a foreign central bank or monetary authority that is held for its own account. Uh, and as, as we mentioned, unlike other general immunity provisions, there is no exception here. This is absolute, uh, for, so, so no commercial activity exception, and any waiver must be absolutely expressed. It cannot be implied. Uh, so there is a little, little uncertainty under the use of some of these terms. The held for its own account, uh, the requirement that the central bank or monetary authority assets be held for its own account was not defined. Uh, we do have some court cases in the U.S. that, that have interpreted that phrase, uh, including a 2011 court case regarding, regarding Argentine central bank assets that were held at the New York Fed. Uh, the appeals court found that where assets are held in the name of a central bank monetary authority, the assets are presumed to be immune from attachment. That presumption can be rebutted uh, by demonstrating that 
the uh, particular assets are not being used for central bank functions, but that is a very high bar and very difficult to overcome. That's a very common sense approach, but it, it, it is uh, common that uh, the courts do respect the name on an account mean, carry, carries quite a bit of meaning. The, the New York Fed filed an amicus brief in that case, and we do file amicus brief, briefs in uh, these sorts of cases from time to time. Uh, as the, uh, one of the world's largest custodians of official reserves, we have an interest in making sure these rules are, are clear and, and, and uh, unambiguous. Uh, the position that we advocated for in the Argentine case is the, the, the position that the court adopted, uh, so we're, we're, we're happy about that. More recently, uh, U.S. Congress has taken steps to carve back sovereign immunity, both jurisdictional immunity and attachment immunity, uh, in certain situations and primarily related to terrorism and, and terrorist acts. Uh, for example, in 2002, uh, the Congress passed the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, or TRIA, uh, which uh, amended the FSIA to permit attachment of blocked assets of a terrorist party to satisfy an award of compensatory damages. So what does a, a plaintiff have to show under TRIA to successfully attach assets? Uh, the judgment has to be against a terrorist party, and TRIA defined a terrorist party as a, a terrorist, a terrorist organization, or a foreign state that has been designated by the U.S. government as a state sponsor of terrorism. So you have to have a terrorist party. The judgment has to relate to an act of terrorism or, or an act that, that is um, uh, otherwise excluded from jurisdictional immunity under the FSIA uh, because of the type of act that it was. Uh, the assets have to be blocked, um, so they have to be subject to sanctions. Uh, and, and uh, as Ingrid has described a bit, um, blocked assets are, are any assets seized or frozen by the United States uh, under the International uh, Emergency Economic Powers Act, or AIPA. Uh, that is the, the uh, basis for most um, uh, sanctions that are imposed in the United States. Uh, so the assets have to be blocked assets. The assets uh, must be assets of the terrorist party, its agencies or instrumentalities. Uh, and that will be very interesting as we talk a little bit later. Uh, and the attachment can only be to the extent of compensatory damages. We don't allow attachment for punitive damages. Um, so I think we'll, we'll walk through this uh, exemption exception to uh, immunity a bit later, but um, I guess I'll stop there to let you continue. Thank you so much because you've been extremely clear in a, in a very complex area. So thank you for illuminating us. Enlightening us, sorry. <laughs> I turn to you, Irina. Um, maybe you can help us to see or give our, your views about whether there is a conflict between sanctions impacting central banks and immunities. I mean, this has been uh, coming up from uh, the previous interventions, but please. Thank you. Um, thank you for raising this very important question and thank you for having me here today. So basically, when we are talking about uh, economic sanctions and immunity entitlements, uh, how do they relate? The answer to these questions lies in how broad we interpret central bank immunity. And in fact, there is almost, uh, the almost universal acceptance that central bank immunity uh, exists when it comes to central bank assets, and that at least at minimum, it protects these assets from measures of execution. So any property of central bank, as well as property of other monetary authorities, protected if there is a court decision against certain core uh, against certain state it should be protected but when it comes to uh, unilateral sanctions in particular sanctions unilateral sanctions which are not authorized by the united nations security council the question here is that these measures are usually taken based on domestic laws of the countries that implement these measures and this is to an extent like executive decisions so the question is how broad do we interpret immunity entitlements and in this respect the literature at least and the, the legal opinion, there are three different divergent opinions on this matter. And in particular, it becomes even more pertinent in the context of the discussion of the confiscation of the Russian central bank assets. So first view is that central bank immunities should be interpreted very broad. This view is based on the idea that immunity entitlements are, as such come from the principle of sovereign equality of states, 
and that's why state property should be entitled to very broad protection of any measures of constraint, irrespective of these measures taken as a part of the court proceedings or outside of the court proceedings, thus including also measures of constraint such as unilateral economic sanctions. Second strand of literature, which is also Ingrid is a prominent representative of this strand of literature, it talks about that uh, immunity entitlements are more like a uh, concept which applies in the context of juris, uh, judicial proceedings. So, and here quite often, supporters of this view cite ICJ decision uh, in the immunities case, which was initiated by, Germ by Germany against Italy, about this kind of very procedural nature of immunity entitlements. And that's based following this logic, we come to a conclusion that not all the sanctions, even those which have certain imply certain measures of constraint against central bank assets, are covered by immunity entitlement. And the third strand of literature, which emerged more in the context of discussion of confiscation of Russian assets, is the discussion that any measure of confiscation in one or another way will implicate judicial oversight. And in such cases, according to kind of domestic legal systems, there should be an oversight and the courts will be faced, unavoidably faced with the need to decide how, how to imply immunity guarantees in this context. And now turning back to the current discussion, which implicates Russian central bank assets and also what has been happening globally. So in the context uh, of this discussion, it's important to say that indeed in the early days of the invasion, approximately half of the Russian central bank assets was immobilized as a response to the invasion and as a, one of the, these coordinated G7 efforts, because in the context of the invasion, what we have seen unprecedented G7 cooperation in terms of imposing sanctions between different countries. And as, as the war progressed, we have seen more and more discussion about the possibility of confiscating or using these assets to generate some profit. And in this respect, it's interesting to reflect also on the development currently happening in different jurisdictions. So, for example, uh, Canada was the first state which amended its domestic law to allow confiscation of state owned and private owned assets, irrespective of the fact whether these assets obtain in a legal or illegal way. This was, uh, these amendments were adopted in June last year and in, in December last year Canada started first case, so they filed before the court first side case, but it implicates only private assets. So they started a case against private assets of a Russian, uh, sanctioned Russian oligarch. Uh, and in June this year Canada also sized a Russian registered cargo airplane, uh, arguing that it belongs to one of the sanctioned entities. Looking at what has been done in the United Kingdom, for example, this year before hosting Ukraine Recovery Conference, United Kingdom announced amendment of its domestic sanctions regulations, in particular stating that assets of Russia will stay frozen in the United, in the United Kingdom as long as the reparations are paid to Ukraine. In other ways, they amended their domestic uh, sanctions regulation to say that objective of these uh, measures are not only to force Russia to stop its kind of illegal aggression against Ukraine, but also that Russia is now has a duty to pay reparations and these assets will stay frozen in the country as long as these reparations uh, has not been paid. Also, this new regulation allows private individuals to donate their frozen assets to recovery of Ukraine if they wish to do so. So at the EU level, we have seen two parallel developments happening. First, it's this idea that uh, violation of European Union sanctions, here they are called restrictive measures, should be criminalized. So it should be considered as an offense. And that's and also based on the if some of these assets are implicated in sanctions circumvention practices, mm -hmm. they should there should be allowed a confiscation of these assets. In other words, in some cases, if adopted, this directive would allow that some of the frozen assets might potentially be confiscated if there is enough evidence to prove that they have been implicated in some sort of sanctioned circumvention practices. As of now, this directive is still under consideration, but there is a significant probability that till the end of this year we'll have already some sort of solution to this issue. And second, it's this discussion at the EU level of how to use frozen or immobilized Russian central bank assets to generate proceeds, which can then go to Ukraine as a part of compensation on behalf of Russia.
So to this discussion, we will return a bit later. And also, I would like to draw attention to the statement of the G7 uh, th that was issued in April this year, which explicitly says that countries have agreed that before there is any resolution to the conflict, central bank assets will stay immobilized in their respective jurisdictions. But at the same time, it was underlined that any resolution to the ongoing conflict should also resolve the situation of reparations. But at the same time, if you read this statement, you can come to a conclusion there is there is no any decision beyond the agreement that this asset should stay immobilized and, and then there should be some sort of concerted effort. So as we see, states generally look at different options, but what we can see also from the state practice is that states are in general very much hesitant to confiscate central bank assets. And there are a number of reasons for this. First, there is this questionable legality of this move under international law, in particular state immunity. But at the same time, there is a concern, more like a policy concern, of setting a very dangerous precedent for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irina, also for bringing in the element of confiscation, which of course is uh, present in our minds. I would like to move to another aspect of, of sanctions, and I turn back to you, uh, Eric, again. So uh, several of us have uh, read in the press that uh, the New York Fed transferred recently three and a half uh, billion uh, from uh, the uh, Bank of Af Afghanistan to the BIS. Maybe you can tell us a little bit what happened and uh, the reasons behind it and the instruments through which that was done. Yeah. That, that's a great question, and I think there's a great deal of confusion around exactly what happened from a legal perspective in that situation. There was a New York Times article last week that reported Biden, President Biden had ordered $3.5 billion of DAB assets uh, to be transferred to a trust, and, and that is not technically what happened. Uh, so let me tell you technically what happened. Um, but I think it's first, let's walk through some events, and, and uh, this is a great case study in both sanctions and, and uh, TRIA and things like that. So. In August 2021, we're just past the two-year anniversary, the, the Taliban took over in Afghanistan. As a result, the New York Fed uh, suspended withdrawals from the uh, Afghanistan Bank's account at the New York Fed. Uh, that's our standard procedure for situations in which we are unsure who has the authority to act for an account. Uh, we unfortunately have done that from time to time. Uh, so, so we froze withdrawals from the account um, no sanctions or other uh, U.S. government actions were taken at the time uh, with respect to the, the DAB assets. Shortly thereafter, in September and October, uh, some plaintiffs who had judgments against the Taliban, existing judgments against the Taliban for the 9-11 activities in the U.S., uh, filed to attach DAB assets uh, at the New York Fed under the Terrorist Risk Insurance Act. Uh, they served writs of execution on the New York Fed uh, and filed motions seeking uh, turnover of those DAB assets to, to those plaintiffs. Uh, the New York Fed complied with the writs of execution and, and kept the account basically locked down uh, during this time. Fast forward to fe uh, February 11th, 2022, a busy day for the U.S. government. We, we, a number of things happened. We had an executive order from President Biden that came out. Uh, Biden cited humanit the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and the potential for economic collapse uh, as an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. He therefore ordered that all uh, DAB property in the U.S. be blocked from transfer unless otherwise permitted by regulation, order, directive, or, or license. So the assets at that point in time became, became uh, blocked, uh, sanctioned assets. Uh, also on February 11th, uh, OFAC issued a license to the New York Fed directing the New York Fed to transfer $3.5 billion to a new account at the New York Fed for the Afghanistan Bank. So we now had two accounts at the Fed, one their existing account and the secondly a, a new account, but still all accounts for the Afghanistan Bank. The license also required that upon receipt of instruction from individuals who had been certified by the Secretary of State pursuant to Section 25B of the Federal Reserve Act as having authority to receive control or dispose of property uh, for or from the account of the Afghanistan Bank, so-called so 25B certified individuals. So upon instruction from a 25B certified individual 
uh, the New York Fed was instructed to transfer up to 3.5 billion to a new account set up at an international through an international financing mechanism uh, established for the benefit of the uh, Afghan people. Um, so th there's a lot in there, but let's go back for a second to what is a 25B certified individual. So 25B refers to a section of the Federal Reserve Act that contemplates having the U.S. Secretary of State certify that an individual has the authority to receive control or dispose of assets of a state or central bank held at the Reserve Bank. It allows the Reserve Bank to look to the Secretary of State for guidance around who the U.S. government recognizes as having the authority to act for the state and its instrumentalities. Now, that is a judgment that can be very difficult for an individual Reserve Bank to make on its own. It's a judgment that clearly has foreign policy ramifications. So from the Federal Reserve perspective, best left to uh, the government. So this is the mechanism that, that allowed, in, in other situations as well, the government to, to tell the New York Fed, this person has authority to act for the, for the central bank. On September 14th, 2022, uh, a number of press releases came out that announced the creation of the Afghan Fund. The Afghan Fund is a Swiss foundation. Uh, it has a board of directors comprised of four individuals. The Afghan Fund opened an account at, at the BIS. The BIS is not involved with the governance of the Afghan Fund. It is only uh, the bank for the Afghan Fund's account. Uh, subsequent to the establishment of the Afghan Fund, uh, the FRB, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, transferred $3.5 billion from the new account that was set up to the, the BIS account. Uh, and we did that upon receipt of instructions from individuals who had been certified under 25B uh, as having the authority to act for the central bank. So why wasn't this a confiscation of uh, the DAB assets? Biden just didn't order it? Well, the short answer is that the Fed was acting at the direction of individuals who had been certified by the U.S. State Department as authorized to act for the Central Bank of Afghanistan. The OFAC license was, was very narrowly tailored to permit only that activity with respect to uh, DAB assets. So that was the only thing that those individuals could have instructed us to do that we would have been permitted to do. Um, but, but the OFAC license didn't cause it to happen. The OFAC license permitted it to happen upon instruction of the certified individuals. So let me turn back a bit now to the efforts of the plaintiffs that had judgments against the, the, the Taliban uh, uh, looking to attach the DAB assets. This is still a matter of active litigation uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, there was a ruling by the U.S. District Court, uh, uh, Southern District of New York recently. It is under appeal. Uh, but it's, I think it's illustrative to walk through what the district court found uh, about the application of the Terrorist Risk Insurance Act. Uh, so remember the elements. Uh, the judgment had to be against a terrorist party. Well, in this case, the judgment was against the Taliban, and Taliban is in the U.S. considered a terrorist party, so that element was met. Uh, the judgment must arise from a terrorist act. That element was also met in this case. The, el uh, the third element was that assets must that being attached must be blocked assets. Now, it's interesting to note, at the time that the writ of execution was, was served on the Fed, uh, the assets were not blocked. The assets were not blocked until February of 2022. At that time, they became blocked and the element would have been met, but initially this, this element was not met. Um, it's also important to note that the, the way the U.S. courts have interpreted blocked assets, sanctioned assets, is that it excludes assets that are subject to a license. So the 3.5 billion assets that were uh, permitted to go to the Afghan fund were subject to a license and therefore not blocked uh, pursuant to U.S. law. Um, there, there was actually a separate um, a ruling made uh, and, and a filing a statement of interest filed by the Department of Justice also on, on the February 11th date, uh, asserting that those assets should be uh, cleared as, as not blocked, um, released from the writ of execution so that they could be sent, if instructed, to, to uh, the Afghan fund. Uh, but the 3.5 billion of assets that remain at the New York Fed are still blocked and, and, and this element would be met for those assets. Uh, the next element was the assets being attached uh, must be the assets of a terrorist party as agencies or instrumentalities. And this is where the court case, uh, where, where the district court found that the plaintiff's case failed. Uh, 
Uh, the U.S. government uh, has, has not, had not, and still has not uh, recognized the Taliban as the uh, government of Afghanistan. Uh, the court noted that Dob uh, is the Afghan central bank, not the Taliban central bank. So th this is somewhat subtle and can be confusing, but in, in some sense we can think about the Taliban as a political party. Uh, if a plaintiff in the U.S. had a judgment against the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, they couldn't attach the assets of the U.S. government. Um, uh, regardless of who was in charge, uh, who was the president or who, who was in charge of Congress uh, at, at that time. Uh, the other analogy that's, that's been used sometimes is, is sort of a corporation and its shareholders. So that the, the, if you think of the Afghan uh, Central Bank as a corporation and uh, the shareholders as the Taliban, the assets of the corporation are not the assets of the shareholder. Uh, that's the theory we used here. So the court said, um, that the, the, they do not view the assets held at the New York Fed as assets of the Taliban and therefore uh, ruled against the, the plaintiffs trying to attach those assets. But I note that that is still under appeal. Oh. Another very complex case uh, enlightened for us or clarified for us. Thank you very much, Rick. Would you like to add something perhaps on the Afghan uh, situation, Ingrid? Um. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that uh, with with Rick that it's uh, uh, fascinating, and um, I just want to highlight a couple of um, interesting public international law issues involved here. So the half of the Afghan Central Bank assets that have been transferred to uh, the Afghan Fund um, uh, don't present an issue of immunity. There's been no judicial, there's been no court finding, there's been no judicial action with respect to those assets. It's been purely executive branch. Um, and there's no requirement under public international law that the United States um, recognizes the Taliban, although the Taliban is in de facto power in Afghanistan, right? It, each country can make its own decision about who it wants to recognize um, as the government of another country. But the interesting issue raised by this is what legal obligations does the United States have to a country whose government it does not recognize? Those obligations might include giving the de facto but unrecognized government control over the central bank assets located in the forum state. I'm not sure that's correct. There's some practice the other way, including um, Venezuela. But what's very unusual in the Afghan case is the United States has taken the category in public international law of recognition. And instead of recognizing a de facto government of Afghanistan, we've made a very, we've made a, a recognition just of some gentlemen in Switzerland. And we have turned central bank assets over to them called the Afghan uh, fund. We haven't recognized them as the government of Afghanistan. We're not recognizing them as the de facto or the government in exile. And we haven't done anything except recognize them for this very targeted purpose of disposing of central bank assets. Now, I... I'm, I'm very sympathetic with the U.S. government, with the U.S. government. The objective here is to try to use those central bank assets to aid the Afghan people without putting in, them in the hands of, of, of the Taliban. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be sympathetic to the objective, but I, I think this maneuver with rec raises some very interesting questions of the power, recognition power, and how it relates to um, assets located in the forum state. Um, the other central bank assets are mired in this complex litigation, which Rick has helpfully explained. Um, I just want to, um, I mean, if, if those plaintiffs are successful, this will be a confiscation of Afghan central bank assets. It will take those assets and it will put them in the hands of American citizens who have been victims of terrorist attacks. Um, notice what's happening here. Afghan central bank assets are turned over to United States citizens for judgments against the Taliban as Rick said, not judgments against Afghanistan. These are legal judgments about the organization called the Taliban. Um, and it's a little bit rich on the one hand to say that we don't recognize the Taliban as the government of Afghanistan. On the other hand, to take Afghan central bank assets and use them to pay um, the debts of the Taliban. Um, this, in some sense, brings us full circle to some comments made yesterday by Alexander Thiele. Um, let me just note 
the engine in the United States for these kinds of confiscations are political pressure. This, this, this is not the courts. This is, this is not even really the executive branch. This is Congress over and over becoming more and more specific that Congress wants to authorize Iranian central bank assets to be turned over to victims of terrorism. This is what happens when you get too deeply mired in the political um, process. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Very nice compliment. <laughs> and I open. Uh, <laughs> so maybe let's come back to the Russian Ukraine situation, Irina. Maybe uh, can you tell us what you consider uh, about the idea uh, of the uh, that is on the table at the moment uh, and how uh, the idea of using the proceeds uh, from the um, uh, seized uh, Ger um, Russian um, central bank assets, how can that relate to the central bank immunity and would that require the development of a new exception for the rule of central bank immunity? Thank you. So uh, while we are kind of operating in reality where there is um, hardly any chance of peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine in near or mid-term future, countries start wondering uh, about how they can use those immobilized central bank assets at least partially compensate Ukraine. Because as of now, the, the last estimate of the damage that was released in March uh, this year already counted that the cost of reconstruction will already exceed uh, 400 uh, billion US dollars. And this was before the dam was destructed and be before many other events happened. So uh, at the EU level, as I briefly mentioned, there is this initiative to look about criminalization of violation of EU sanctions, but which will mostly it cannot, uh, it will apply to new violations. Even if this directive is adopted, it will apply to new violations. And, and then most probably this will touch upon private assets. So when it comes to central bank assets, the idea that started gaining traction from last year, it was how, how can these assets be used in order to generate some proceeds, which can be then transferred to Ukraine in the fulfillment of Russia's duty to pay reparations. So uh, there is, and again, I, I want to say very clear here, we're talking about idea because as of now, there is no official document. So we are just speculating about media reports and some of the leaked documents which are available online. So uh, in November last year, there was already discussion, like there was some proposals uh, uh, submitted by the European Commission on how these assets can be used. And uh, from the available information, there is only press release, which is two pages, where basically the idea is presented that there is short term, uh, kind of uh, prone and then there is long-term approach. So short-term approach focuses on a temporary active management of these assets with the idea of generating proceeds, which will go to Ukraine, but without touching the main, the core of, of the central bank assets, which have Russian central bank assets, which have been immobilized. And the long-term perspective is that w once there is a resolution to the conflict, when Russia pays reparations, then this, uh, this assets will be, sanctions will be lifted, this assets will be uh, again mobilized um, and then transferred to Russia. Uh, so based on this uh, ad hoc working group on frozen assets which has been established presented a non-paper, it's called non-paper in March this year. Again this um, non-paper is available online, some, some of the journalists uh, leaked this uh, non-paper. So basically uh, after reading this uh, non-paper uh, one comes to conclusion that the idea behind uh, this whole proposal is uh, to take liquid uh, assets of the Russian Central Bank to put them in what is called temporary active management to generate some proceeds which are estimated approximately to 0.6% annual rate and then these proceeds will go to Ukraine until Russia pays the full amount of reparation to Ukraine. So there is no time, any time limit for this. And at the same time, two legal questions were discussed in this known paper. One of these is state immunity entitlements and how do they relate to, to this idea? And second, it's the EU domestic legal framework, how to implement this idea of active management inside of how to implant this idea inside of the existing legal order. So talking about uh, the non-paper approach on uh, state immunity, basically uh, there is more or less two paragraphs, but one of the substance, substance how they see uh, state immunity. Uh, 
playing a role in, in this discussion. And in fact, they talk that uh, state immunity, uh, the way they are reflected in the UN Convention, are a very narrow concept. And as such, and here I would like to quote, the principle of state immunity does not prohibit proportionate administrative restrictive measures which are temporary, reversible, and not confiscatory in nature, and which pursue the legitimate objectives of the Union. So, in fact, the, the whole emphasis of this non paper is that this is temporary measure, it's reversible, and at the end of the day, we will return the main kind of the amount of the asset that was immobilized on the 28th of February 2022. So, um, also turning uh, another interesting um, a question that was raised in this non paper it was that, in fact, there is no any relevant uh, practice in this respect. So, uh, what was discussed is that uh, the practice of the European Union in using restrictive measures against uh, assets of private individuals or companies, so-called sanctioned companies or individuals, that in fact, uh, this non-paper talks that when there are restrictive measures imposed by the European Union against some entities or individuals, it usually does not imply, uh, and, and these measures imply freezing of the assets, at the end of the day, it does not imply that there will be some proceeds generated by these assets. So at the end of the day, when these sanctions are lifted, there is no proceeds so, and they more or less kind of referring to this practice of European Union in implementing sanctions to try to justify uh, the same actions when it comes to European, uh, when it comes to Russian central bank assets. Um, and yeah, as of now, this is the most current state of debate. There have been also some uh, some reports that as of now there is a discussion of uh, whether even to go a step further and, for example, to introduce a tax on these proceeds. So just not conf just confiscate the proceeds, which can be get from uh, active management of these assets, but to impose some sort of a tax levy mm -hmm. and and then transfer this money to, to Ukraine. And uh, talking about, uh, turning to the second question, which relates to the uh, possible exception to state immunity entitlements, um, in fact, uh, there have been some discussions what are the legal ways of establishing such an exception, uh, because as of now, except of uh, the, the only exception is state consent, when the state who owns this asset consents that these assets can be used for these purposes. Uh, and that's why sometimes in the literature there is a big criticism from uh, human rights activists or from other interested groups that state immunity guarantee too much kind of, state immunity guarantees are too broad, they do not take into account uh, um, other factual circumstances which might happen. But uh, looking at kind of two most plausible ideas which have been discussed is the idea of um, introducing such an exception, very narrow exception with respect to this particular situation which implicates uh, war initiated by Russia against Ukraine based on the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly with the majority support. But then again, this is more like a theoretical discussion in the literature. In practice, it might be hard to harness such a broad support because uh, in November last year, there have been already United Nations General Assembly resolutions which acknowledged that Russia has an obligation to pay reparations to Ukraine. And it should be noted that that resolution was adopted with a slight majority. So 94, 94 members of the United Nations voted in favor, with 73 members abstaining in the vote. And then again, it, the discussion was very much politicized because many states complained that they didn't get the same amount of justice after there was some, some um, conflicts in which the states were implicated. So again, looking at how hard it was again ready to gain support for this merely resolution, which just states the fact that Russia has the duty before Ukraine to pay for the destruction it caused, it, it, it's probably highly unlikely that, that there will be a possibility to uh, gather enough support for the resolution, which will say that let's waive state immunity from central bank assets. The other idea, which has also got some dis some attention in uh, in different circles, also among academics and practitioners, is this idea of multilateral agreement signed between the countries that have immobilized Russian central bank assets, in which they will kind of agree to to in these particular circumstances to lift. Uh, state immunity and in such a way kind of find a way to confiscate these assets and then to repurpose them for Ukraine's reconstruction. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, so two interesting proposals, one for an exception that uh, should be uh, 
supported by the international community. So when there is a resolution and only in very serious cases and probably only in case of armed aggression, now the question is how you differentiate this instrument from other uh, 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 reactions that international law allows for armed aggression. Or, so question mark, but uh, it's a difficult issue indeed. And the second uh, multilateral agreement uh, between the ones on one side of the, of the uh, so the holders of these reserves against the owners, that uh, also could be quite uh, quite uh, a, a criticizable approach. But uh, we welcome all creative uh, ideas, but they need to be reflected upon, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Irina. I'm still here with a question that um, I would like to ask Ingrid, because at the beginning of your uh, first talk, you mentioned, because we were talking about confiscation, and you mentioned that there is something sitting uh, in Parliament in the United States talking about confiscation. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can uh, actually read the relevant language of the statute to you, because it's really short, and it makes a lot of things very clear. It's it's buried here deep in the statute, but it says the president may confiscate any Russian sovereign assets subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. There you go. I can say I could say a lot more things about the statute, uh, but that's it. Um, there um, other um, important language absolutely prohibits the possibility of any judicial review of any aspect of the statute. Now, those, of course, who follow this and who have been paying attention, right, by lifting, uh, removing judicial review, we've taken this out of um, the realm of immunities, uh, right? There was no need to amend the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Usually when you confiscate assets, foreign sovereign assets in the United States, you also need to amend the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act because normally you need a court order to turn over assets. If someone has a piece of property deposit well I'm, you know too much anyway normally uh, normally right you need a court order enabled in order to go in and turn over the actual ownership of the property this the statute doesn't require um that um in terms of the disposition of the confiscated assets um that is supposed to happen um uh, uh through the secretary of state um who at the united states serves at the pleasure of the president um i, I could say more but um i'll, I'll turn it over to no. I, think, I think that's the meat of it no but maybe before turning over, do you think this is consistent, apart from U.S. constitutional law with international law? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, so as I've said, it, it avoids um, it avoids immunity. Um, uh, I, I think it um, you know it may um, via the, the the bilateral there is a bilateral investment treaty between Russia and the United States, but it is not in force. Um, so there is no restrictions from a relevant bit. Um, it probably violates um, customary international law that pro prohibits expropriation. Um, most of the literature on that is about private expropriations, right? The normal th um, thing is a foreign company invests in your state and then you expropriate that. There really aren't many examples of, there are no examples of con confiscations of central bank assets like this that I'm aware of through through executive action. But I, 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 I do think there are um, some international legal constraints that sound in, 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 in that way. Um, the the bill is confusing um, because it, for example, has a has a little discussion of countermeasures, um, but then uh, you only need to use countermeasures if you are excusing conduct that would otherwise be a violation of international law. So it sort of wanders into a little bit about countermeasures without actually explaining the predicate, which is what international law it thinks would be violated um, through um, uh, through the statute. Um, and we haven't talked much about countermeasures, but I'd be, of course, happy to do so in question and answer. But I'll, I'll turn it over to further questions. Yeah, and maybe. Rick, you, uh, you might end up, if this is approved, uh, having to deal with that. Which we would, of course, follow the law um, if, if that became the law. And I, I can't comment on, on policy matters and, and whether it's a good idea or not uh, to do this. Um, 
I, I will note my personal view is that there, there is a tension between wanting to do something in the face of egregious facts and, you know, potentially creating a precedent that takes us down a very slippery slope. Um, but I'm sure our policymakers are, are weighing the benefits and potential costs appropriately when thinking about the legislation. Okay, I understand this <laughs> is a difficult, uh, a difficult area. Um, but maybe, maybe it will not be passed after all, so who knows? Yeah, let's see. Good. I go back to um, you, Irina. Um, you mentioned the UK. It was very interesting to hear, uh, you know, what what uh, has been done in, in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that this, this um, um, you know, blocking the proceeds until um, the um, compensation is justified as possible countermeasure in under international law, or is it something new of the sort? Um, so basically, this discussion of state immunities um, implicates several areas of law, like one is legality of unilateral you know, sanctions, second it's immunity, and third, big branch of law which is implicated in this discussion is state immunity, rules of state immunity, and possibility to justify different measures which are taken with respect to central bank assets as countermeasures. And in this respect, it's important to keep in mind several issues that characterize countermeasures as such. First, countermeasures, they are illegal as such, but they allowed in certain circumstances as a response to prior illegal conduct. So uh, with respect to this UK initiative uh, to keep uh, Russian assets frozen, there have been already a, a discussion that uh, to an extent, even if it violates immunity entitlements uh, of, central, of Russian central bank, this might um, might be potentially justified as a, as a legitimate countermeasure. And in particular, uh, the, the discussion was that this should be justified as a potential, um, as a permissible countermeasure because Russia has a duty to pay reparations. And that's why uh, UK takes this measure as a countermeasure. But but then when we are talking about countermeasures and countermeasures taken by not directly injured states, we are a bit in a murky legal terrain because um, codification of, uh, of state immunity has taken half a century. But at the end of the day, when the draft articles on state responsibility were issued, they didn't resolve the issue of so-called non-directly injured states. So, so there is still kind of discussion whether non-injured states can take countermeasures, so-called third-party countermeasures or countermeasures in general interest. So when we are talking about trying to justify any restrictions or any me measures taken against Russian central bank assets, we should keep in mind several uh, several obstacles which exist for not directly injured states to take such measures. First, it's that they are not directly injured in the meaning of the draft articles. So the possibility of taking countermeasures is already questionable. Second, it's the, the nature of countermeasures as such. As defined in draft articles, countermeasures should be taken to induce compliance with international obligations. So as such, countermeasures are not punitive in their nature. So, and that's why the, the idea has emerged that let's not say that we take countermeasures uh, against Russia in response to aggression, because then it will be like more a punitive response. But let's discuss that Russia has to compensate, so they have a duty to bear reparations. And we are taking these countermeasures in, in respect of this, in trying to induce them to comply uh, with the international obligation of paying reparation. And third issue, it's uh, the most controversial issue when it comes to this discussion of confiscation, is the, the issue that uh, countermeasures should be reversible in their nature. So they should be temporary and reversible. And it explicitly stated in draft articles that once international violation ceases, uh, it, the states which have introduced countermeasures also have a duty to lift those measures. That's why kind of, to an extent, there is a possibility to try to justify UK decision as more like a permissible countermeasures within the meaning of draft articles. But at the same time, there are still obstacles because there is still discussion about this legality of third party countermeasures, which, which is not very clearly resolved as of now. Thank you very much. So I myself, I'm exhausted my question. I would like to open uh, the floor once more if you have anything to add and then to the audience. We go to the audience right away. Wow. Okay. Try to be short in your questions because I would like to allow everybody and we have 15 minutes. Mikael. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Uh, two quick remarks. Uh, first remark, uh, big compliment to all panelists, including you, Chiara, for that wonderful panel. Very clear, very, very impressive. Remark number two, it seems to me that there is a distinct difference in the US approach and the European uh, approach uh, you you described, Irina. I think um, by, by um, walking the countermeasure line, we recognize in principle immunity and we look for tailored uh, solutions to the atrocities uh, that uh, currently happen and how to 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 cope in a very imperfect way with that i think um the um, the argument which was made uh, that there is um, zero straight practice uh, for for putting executive action uh, within the realm of um, of uh, immunity law um, is uh, maybe to be to be uh, considered under the angle that uh, this is largely sorry Ingrid uh, that this is that this is uh, uh, very much of course given the importance of Wall Street and uh, of 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 New York as as the hub uh, of of the world's financial system uh, U.S. state practice and U.S. state practice of course is uh, as you as you very ably pointed out very much. Uh, influenced by by the um, um, political realities uh, in, in 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 Washington, um, so that that uh, my second remark, um, I would very much uh, favor an approach um, that uh, that um, uh, you have in your last uh, contribution, Irina, uh, presented as 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 one way discussed right now. Thank you very much. Maybe we take another couple of questions. So um, yeah. Thank you, Daniel Guk, uh, European Central Bank. Uh, Chiara, I promise very short and practical questions. First to, uh, to Mr. Ostranda about TRIA uh, uh, and the link to possible designation of Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism, likely or not politically, if it does happen with Russia because of its sponsoring of uh, abductions, assassinations, etc joins the ranks of North Korea, Syria, Cuba, and is designated as a state sponsor of terrorism by the US government. And then some other party like Ukrainian government obtains a judgment against Russia and tries to domesticate it in, in the US. Would it be an avenue to attach uh, Russian central bank assets uh, for compensatory measures uh, under this construction tria? related. And the second uh, question, a bit more broadly, uh, to Dr. Bogdanova, uh, I, you mentioned this multilateral treaty as, as one way of dealing with uh, Russian assets. I feel it's the most politically realistic one because of dealing with uh, collective action problems against third states. Uh, however, I feel the states would need more than just uh, multilateral treaty, they would need some kind of international judgment to rely on to as far as possible is isolate themselves from uh, from political risks here to, to, to indicate that this is really a, a special situation based on the judicial action by independent body. And in this context, my question to you, do you see uh, it as helpful to link this topic to, to the tribunal on the crime of aggression? Is it realistic in your view? Uh, this type of comment would be highly welcome. Many thanks. Thank you. Maybe if the speaker could say their name uh, before speaking, because I know you, but not everybody, <laughs> please. Uh, so there are two in that row and then, uh, yes, take those two and then, and then maybe the fifth and then we stop, yeah? Uh, so, my name is Giulio Cortesi, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the University of Cartay. Uh, I want to thank all of you for the very inspiring uh, intervention. I will be very quick, I have a, just a question for Professor Wood about uh, the definition of uh, central bank, because uh, I think it's, uh, uh, you mentioned the issue of Iran, we all know that there was a case between Iran and United States in the first instance, the preliminary judgment and the second judgment. To my impression, it's quite debated, there are four dissenting opinions, maybe more, about the issue if the International Court of Justice has changed the test to define an international central, uh, central bank under international law. 
there are different opinions on this. Uh, I have mine, of course, but I would be very interested in your. So thank you very much, and uh, I hand the... Okay. Good morning. My name is Sergio Cabo. I used to be former legal member of the ECB Legal Services. And my question is, is a broad question and to all members of the panel, if they have the answer. And the, the question is about the legal cases that the Russians started against, uh, I would understand, to the, against the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or against other counterparties regarding sanctions and uh, freezing of assets. Do you have any information that you could provide to the audience on this regard on legal actions that Russia started against all those decisions? Thank you. Okay, Carolina, and then the last one, and then we stop. Uh, first, Carolina, in just a sec. Thank you very much. I will be very brief. I have many questions, but just one. Please. No, your name. Please. Ah, sorry, uh, Karen Kleiner. I'm professor at the University of Paris Cité. Uh, wonderful debate. I'm very interested in the topic of confiscation. But if I understood well, Irina, you said that uh, the fact that we could confiscate the uh, like the interest produced by or generated by an account, that would be a different kind of confiscation than just to confiscate to confiscate the assets uh, but if i remember well the uh, eu guidelines on the implementation of uh, of uh, freezing assets uh, and also other legislative uh, recommendation of member states uh, it is not prohibited even though an account is frozen to receive to receive some credits on this account so i mean the, the the interest itself uh, is still the property of the uh, person uh, whose asset has been frozen. So how uh, do you, I mean, in international law, it's a new debate. So how can we handle this? And I think that even if we say that we will confiscate not the asset itself, but just the interest produced by those assets, this is still there's still a problem of, of course, property law, because also the some guidelines uh, say specifically that uh, the interest, uh, uh, that those uh, frozen assets may generate interest by themselves. It's not prohibited. Thank you very much. Uh, ben McDonough, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Two quick questions for Richard. First, have you gotten any feedback from other central bank account holders to the extent that you can comment about these recent activities? And second, can you comment on any potential liability that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York faces? Thank you. Looking at the clock, I will give the opportunity to the other questions and then we close all together. So are there further questions in this part of the room? No, but then fine, perfect. So maybe Ingrid, I look at you to start with some of the answers. Uh, gosh, these are such great questions. It's such a privilege to be here and talk about these questions with, with people who, who understand them so well. Um, so on the question about uh, state practice um, for executive branch um, and my statement that there, there isn't really um, any state practice that suggests that immunity is a, is a restriction um, on executive branch action. So just to, just to take one step backwards, when I, when I talk about state practice in that context, I'm talking about, as I've already mentioned, about the immunity statutes in place around the world. So that includes China's immunity statute, Japan's immunity statute, Australia's immunity statute. The, the, these, these statutes apply only to judicial action. So when I'm, when I'm talking about state practice, it's a it's a very global look um, and when it comes to protests right who who has protested sanctions I think this is your point right it's super hard when the United States imposes sanctions for some countries to push back against that the thing though is we have these Iran you know Iran has sued Canada and the United States in the ICJ but not because they think asset freezes violate foreign sovereign immunity Venezuela has pressed its case of the international violations of international law by the United States and the list is very long and it does not include asset freezes as violations of foreign sovereign immunity so again in places where countries have incentives and opportunities um, to develop state practice along these lines that it's just it's just not there um, it's more at the moment it's entirely an academic 
um, argument. There just really isn't any state practice that, that supports this. Um, and I'll say one other, the, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, I've actually come out quite um, strongly opposing designating Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism um, because, as you say, doing so would open Russian central bank assets to execution of certain kinds of judgments those judgments are in favor of US citizens. And so in fact, it would make Russian central bank assets available potentially to litigants other than Ukrainians. Um, and it might actually be entirely counterproductive when it comes to the effort to compensate um, uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, I think that's a, the uh, designating Russia a state sponsor of terrorism is an incredibly poor method to try to use Russian central bank assets to help Ukraine. Um, and the, the ICJ, um, you know, it's interesting, the definition, this goes back to how you started the panel, right, on the definition of state, of, 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 of central banks. And the immunity law takes a very functional approach to what constitutes a central bank. It's are you performing classic monetary functions? Does it look, is it doing the stuff that central banks do, well, whatever you call it? Um, and as, as you know, the, as you already said, the ICJ judgment didn't, didn't deal with immunity at all. Um, so I think it's a little bit difficult to draw many conclusions, um, but I'll, now I'll be quiet. Yes, I'll just pile on the TRIA point a, a, a little bit. Um, I think if you technically, if it were to happen, <clears throat> notwithstanding Ingrid's points about whether it should or shouldn't, um, and other consequences that might occur if, if you did, uh, I think the other hurdle here is Ukraine would have to uh, obtain a judgment in the United States against Russia. I don't know for what violation of U.S. law. And Russia also has jurisdictional immunity in the United States that would have to be overcome. And the exceptions to jurisdictional immunity so far would not extend, I think, to Ukraine. I can't think of one that would, would allow Ukraine to even sue. Um, but interesting theoretical uh, process. Um, under and with respect to the liability that the New York uh, Fed might might face, uh, I, I, with respect to, I, I mean, the two examples, Russia, uh, again, to the point that we are just freezing assets subject to uh, instruction of the U.S. government. Uh, with respect to Afghanistan, uh, back to the 25B point, uh, under the Federal Reserve Act, uh, acting on the, um, allowing someone who has been uh, certified as, as authorized under 25B to instruct us. Uh, we are explicitly immune from liability for following those instructions. So uh, hopefully there is no liability for New York Fed in either case. Thank you. So I will address two questions first about multilateral treaty and the uh, legitimacy indeed. When we are looking about countries that have immobilized uh, assets, it's countries that op also quite often uh, impose different types of unilateral sanctions and they have been already criticized as uh, countries which uh, rely on sanctions outside of the United Nations framework. So it always raises this question of legitimacy and it raises a question of economic coercion against developing or third developing countries and other countries. So that's why turning to the question of tribunal on the crime of aggression as, and then enforcement of this decision. Uh, in fact, when it comes to Ukraine and, and war with Russia, there are many parallel developments in this respect, and Ukraine has been pushing for the creation of the special tribunal. But, but then again, it takes some time. There have been a number of states that have already agreed on the establishment of this tribunal, but this is a process. And also reflecting on this, I think it's not a coincidence that in November last year there was a United Nations General Assembly resolution which already recognized that Russia has a duty to pay reparation and based on this resolution uh, then the action was taken at the Council of Europe where the register of damage was created. So in fact right now there is a register of damage which is established in The Hague with a subsidiary office in Kiev, which will kind of verify all these claims. And I think the reason why this register was established also partly to have a verified record of how much Russia will own at the end of the day. So th that it's not only Ukrainian estimates, but it's also verified by the broader community. So I think obviously the, the decision of the tribunal would be preferred outcome, but there are many factors which which kind of does make this solution that easy. And then turning back quickly to the question of partial confiscation and confiscation. In fact, if we are looking at this uh, idea of partial confiscation or kind of using the proceeds. It, it's again, it's kind of, it's still debatable to what extent it overlaps with all this immunity entitlements, property rights and everything. So it's not that clear cut that if you just use proceeds, it, it becomes immediately legal. And that's why one of the reasons why in fact, now this idea take much longer time because initially it was planned that this idea would be released by the end of summer already will be some official documents now 
it stretched to autumn, and in particular because of many different considerations, uh, which have been also expressed by, by, by different players. And it's, it's it's not that easy. But but in the non-paper, which it, I, I just find it interesting that in non-paper where they discuss this idea in quite positive light, that reflecting on this practice of EU sanctions, for example, when there is when before the freezing of the assets, there have been some kind of contractual obligations, and yes, then you receive some sort of uh, payment uh, on your account if it's frozen. But if there was no such contractual obligations, there is no duty, for example, for a bank that had frozen your bank account to invest it and to get your proceeds to so in a way enrich you. So there is no such duty and they reflect on this practice of the EU sanctions in order to kind of to gather some support for this idea. Thank you. I would like to ask the audience to join me in a big round of applause for this fantastic panel. I myself learned a lot today and I would like also to thank the audience for your active participation is really the key for the good success of the panel. Thank you very much.